so, so Julian, Julian, years before we did that, um, Julian was suggested to us as a director for the video, Can I Play With Madness? And Julian is a bit of a kind of auteur, he's a bit of a one-man show, he does the, his own camera work, he does his own lighting, and as an editor, he edited all the Python films, he had edited Brazil, uh, and, and loads of other stuff as well. Did some cool videos with Kate Bush cloud busting and things like that. So, so Julian came and suggested the storyboard, Can I Play With Madness? Um, I only met Graham very, very briefly um, backstage at an Iron Maiden show in Atlanta because we didn't see Graham when he was actually uh, on the set. Uh, because Can I Play With Madness was one of the first videos we ever did where we were not actually in the video. Um, because we were all, we, we, we told our manager, we're fed up with videos, they're fucking boring. Could we not be in the videos? <laughs> and he goes, well, that's difficult, you're in the band. He goes, well, do something more interesting instead. You know, we don't want to be there. So we, just, it, we decided we'd do a video in which we would not be in the video. Um, and, um, and Graham came on, and he, was, he was, did a fantastic job. But out of that video, I went down the pub with Julian and we started chatting away and said, um, why don't we do a movie together? And Julian said, yeah, let's do a movie about Eddie. I said, that's not going to work. I said, Rod's not going to have to wear that. I have to do a movie about something else. And I came up with the idea that nobody had ever done a film about Alistair Crowley, the eccentric black magician uh, who painted himself as being the wickedest man in the world. So that was Greg Chapman. That's Julian Doyle. Um, could you ever consider doing Iron Maiden as a classical music concert, um, i.e. with a symphony orchestra? Um, it's been tried a lot by all kinds of people, many of whom I respect, and I'll be really honest with you, I don't think it works. Um, uh, I think it might work for the odd specific song, for example, um, uh, Empire of the Clouds, my thing is kind of got orchestra all over it. Uh, but that's just one song. And that was written specifically with that kind of thing in mind. And I could see that working uh, under certain circumstances, but that's only one song. Um, and the problem with orchestras is um, uh, what do you do with them when they're not in use? Uh, you know, uh, which, is for, which is actually for quite a lot of songs if they're going to be really proper rock and roll type songs. Um, uh, if you had one more choice of education, quest, adventure, what would it be? Space, the final frontier. Uh, what's your shoe size? And does it affect your stage performance? <laughs> You know, it's something I've never really given any thought to. <laughs> now you come to mention it. Uh, my shoe size is uh, well. These are size. These are size 43 euro. Size 10 American. Size 9 English. So there you are. That's as good a reason for Brexit as, as I could ever give you. <laughs> The answer is I can't remember because I was asleep. And this one, uh, uh, being a soldier myself, uh, um, I'm wondering what made you fly to Afghanistan uh, to bring home the British troops in 2008. Um, Mark, who wrote that question, I've got to tell you, um, I actually did go to Afghanistan and bring back soldiers from there. Um, that was something which was, which, which people made the assumption and the press who wrote the story went, oh, he brought them back from Afghanistan. No, I was flying an airliner. Airliners are not allowed to go to Afghanistan because they get shot down. So what happens is soldiers come back from Afghanistan and they go through a place called Minhad. Um, in the uh, Emirates, uh, or they end up um, in Akrotiri in Cyprus. And in Cyprus, in Akrotiri, they have a while while they kind of chill out and get used to the idea of going back to 
uh, what might be termed some kind of normal life um, back home. And the airline I worked for, the Stratus is one that went bust in the end, we had one airplane uh, for a couple of years based permanently at an RAF base, uh, Bryce Norton, um, where soldiers came and left to go off to wherever they were going to go off to. So uh, I ended up flying them because it was just my job. If it wasn't me, it was going to be one of the other uh, 50 or 60 pilots of the fleet uh, who flew them. Um, the most emotional flight I did was flying back some guys from the Royal Air Force Regiment um, who don't fly airplanes, but they defend uh, airfields and important installations. Um, so they're pretty much on the sharp end. Anyway, they were coming back from quite a tough uh, engagement over there in Afghanistan and they lost um, they'd lost some people, uh, as in been killed, and um, so the Padre was uh, on the flight with them, and uh, there was myself and the uh, female first officer, who obviously a team together, flying them back, and the Padre comes to the cockpit, and it was funny because the first thing he did was say, how are you doing, it's yeah, good, you know, and he said, um, I just thought I'd give you this, I'd give you a Bible, much, you know, hope you don't need it during the flight. Uh, uh, you know, <laughs> engine failure, hang on, the Ecclesiastes is <laughs> uh, But I, 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 my Uncle John in that earlier picture, I have his service Bible from when he was in the siege of Malta. And actually, it's full of little bookmarks and little phrases and things he's written down. Because when you're sitting hiding under a snooker table and the Germans are dropping bombs right on top of you, sometimes opening up a Bible, I think, probably kind of helped him a little bit, you know. I might even consider doing the same thing under the circumstances, you know. Um, so I had that and it was just a link, it was a curious link. You know, 50 years after 1943, I'm getting this Royal Air Force Bible. It's the same Bible. It's just, okay, it's a plastic cover, not a leather cover, but it's the same book, same print, same everything. So it was amazing to see the link that, 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 that is the same for soldiers for, for millennia uh, that way. Anyway, we flew, we flew the, 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 the guys back, and we flew them unusually. We didn't fly them back to, um, RAF Price Norm. We flew them back to a place called RAF Wittering. Wittering is where they were actually based. Normally they go back to Price Norm and go by bus to where they were based. But Wittering has a sh kind of short runway, it's out the boonies, so we did the landing. And then as we taxied in, I realised that the entire airfield was covered in wives and kids, all lined up with things like Dad, you're my hero, welcome home, we so, I mean, honestly, I, we had to stop the airplane, because I was blubbing, and my first officer was blubbing. We were both looking out of windows the opposite direction, because we didn't want to see each other in tears. <laughs> and I went, I'm going to stop the fucking airplane, otherwise I'm going to bump into something here. <laughs> right, dry our eyes, pull it together, stop the airplane, and then get the hankies out, you know. But honestly, it was a very emotional moment. Um, and that is one of the things when I was flying, that, uh, it's one of the things I miss now, not flying professionally uh, all the time, uh, is, is, is moments like that. And I'm going to finish up with one little thing. Um, uh, uh, who's got the tennis balls? Who called the tennis balls? Who's got the one that says <laughs> cancer? Yay! Congratulations. So, just to, just to, mm. there's various, various things I wrote on the tennis ball beforehand, just to make it more interesting than big tennis balls, really. New balls, old balls, blue balls, all kinds of things. <laughs> but um, this is just the reason I'm still here, effectively. Um, so, over the years, 
So this is me getting towards the end of my treatment in cancer. I'll give you some idea of the sort of the strange mental state that I found myself in. Over the years, my lack of taste in matters like clothing and in particular trousers <laughs> has never bothered me. Lack of taste in food bothered me more than I expected. Biscuits tasted like sand, chocolate like plasticine, only aromatic foods gave any hint of flavour, and that was just because of the smell. Slowly, my energy levels dropped. One day, I went to the supermarket, only a few hundred yards. I shuffled around and got halfway back to the house before I realised I could go on no further. This was beyond exhausted. It was as if every cell in the marrow of my bones was saying, lie down, right now, give up. I sat on a low brick wall for a few minutes to recover. This was fatigue. I thought I'd been tired in my life, but actually, not even close. Early on in treatment, I planned my TV schedule. I'd be watching a lot of daytime TV. It was full of cheery adverts for cancer charities, <laughs> complete with suffering victims asking for contributions. If that didn't cheer me up, there was a string of life insurance ads, plus several <laughs> offering help with funeral costs. <laughs> <laughs> I calibrated my treatment, though, and recovery to a repeat of the classic TV series, The Avengers. At 8 p.m. every night, after a repeat of MASH, all of the Diana Rigg episodes were being shown Monday to Friday. My 33rd and last radiation session was on the 18th of February. My last three-week chemo cycle is beginning on the 16th of February. Get all this. The radiation would actually peak in my system 10 days after the last administration of it. Hmm and would then continue to work for at least two to three months afterwards, but now at a declining rate. So, my peak radiation effect and peak chemo would be on the 28th of February. I calculated this would be the episode when Diana Rigg handed over to Linda Thorst. <laughs> I was not a big fan of Linda Thorson. On that day, I would cease to watch the Avengers and I would restart the process of normality. In other words, I was cured by the Avengers. <laughs> Even if I had to pretend. Oral morphine was a terrific disappointment. I was at least expecting pink elephants or literary inspiration or even a desire to cut off my ear and paint scary pictures mm -hmm. of daffodils. <laughs> no such luck. It just made me drowsy, didn't seem to kill that much of the pain, and worst of all, removed the ability to have a poo. <laughs> a liquid diet of custard and milkshakes didn't help, although I, I emptied sachets of oatmeal into